Jessica, uh, and you can speak with her uh, downstairs at the kids, uh, at the, the children's church, and uh, you can also text her as well or call her, but you have to do that no later than June 21st, which is Wednesday. Not this Wednesday, but the next Wednesday. So we basically gave them, give them three days lead time there. So anyone who has children that would want to be there, please let Erica know. And they do have a great time there because our kids go there. It's, it's a wonderful time. I'm going to be sharing with you from Exodus chapter 18, starting in verse 17. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide for themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure. And all this people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the peoples, chiefs of thousands and hundreds of fifties and of tens. And they judged the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. That's a pretty blunt opening statement coming from Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. He says, what you're doing is not good, which is not what you want to hear from your father-in-law typically. That's a pretty blunt statement. And you know that Moses honors his father-in-law because if you look back in verse 7, when he went out to meet his father-in-law, he bowed down to him and kissed him. So it's obvious that there's love and respect there. What you're doing is not good is what he hears. Well, what was he doing? To find that out, we can go up to verse 13. It says, The next day Moses sat down to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another. And I make them know the statutes and his laws. So all of the weight of leadership and of judgment went to Moses, and he carried it along. He bore the burden of leading, teaching, and judging all of these people with no one else to help. And Jethro said that the, his quote was, the thing is too heavy for Moses. And he said that Moses and the people would wear themselves out. And we understand why that would wear out Moses, because everything would fall to him. But it also says that it would wear out the people. And you stop and think about it and realize if they're sitting around waiting for leadership all day, waiting for judgment, they're waiting for their case to be heard or their issue to be decided, they're sitting around all day and waiting and waiting for leadership. Jethro's wisdom was to solve this problem. And the question is, what is the solution? It wasn't lessening the load. It wasn't Moses refusing to hear all the cases. It wasn't Moses saying, well, I've heard 10 today. That's my limit. Or saying, come back tomorrow. It wasn't lightening the load, refusing to hear the card, card cases, but spreading the load was the answer. Other men were to be called alongside Moses to keep Moses from wearing himself out and to keep from wearing the people out. It ensured more prompt judgment and more responsive leadership for the people. And he didn't just call any type of man. Verse 21 says, Look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe. So God, uh, excuse me, Moses was to select the people that serve in that. And you think about any organization or group of people. If you want to have good success for whatever your goals are, you need good leadership. 
Now, you may accidentally achieve your goals with bad leadership, but more often than not, when you meet your objectives of what you're trying to do, you have good leadership in place. And that's true for businesses, for militaries, for countries, for sports teams, and also for churches. And we see this principle of spreading the load early on here in the scriptures with God's people. And I think in the weeks to come, we're going to see that God talks about spreading that load even into the New Testament as well. So what I would ask you to do is be thinking about how God leads his church even today and how it should be led and how this principle can apply. That's what uh, I ask you to think about this week and in the coming weeks as well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your church. We thank you for the church here, particularly at Waxhaw Baptist. You have a church that spans the globe and spans the centuries, Lord, but right now I pray specifically for the people, the congregation, the leadership that are gathered here at Waxhaw Baptist. I pray that you would give us a vision to follow you, that you would give us the wisdom to do so in a way that honors you and in a way that blesses your people. I pray for Pastor Chris this hour as he brings the word. I pray, Lord, that every person in here would be moved by your spirit, whether hearing the word or singing praises to you. And I pray that you would not depart from us when we depart from your house, Lord, but that you would go with us back to our homes and our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing in your hymnals. It's number 202. And let's just rejoice in the power and the beauty and the wonder of Jesus' name. side of that page to 203. His name is wonderful.
seated.
117, there's something about that name. And please stand. 4 concerns brought out and those 4 concerns that were brought out at the last business meeting was this fresh start organization communication and prayer those were the 4 concerns that were brought out uh, to us in the business meeting on July 16th uh, I am calling a special meeting for the church. Uh, as the pastor, I can do this. Um, we need to come together on that day, and we need to address these concerns. And we will be voting on the biblical structure of elders and deacons at that time. A vote will take place on the 16th to uh, move to this structure or not. So here's what I'm asking of the congregation. I'm asking the congregation to pray, pray and seek God's guidance. Pray and fast and seek God's guidance about this. To read over the qualifications of an elder. To read over the qualifications of a deacon. And for the church to... Um, bring recommendations of who would be qualified in these positions. Now, you can do that in several different ways. Uh, you can, uh, the best way to do it would be to write them down, give them to one of the deacons, or to email me about this. Um, it's, it's something that's not to be taken lightly, folks. Um, 
nor is this a popularity contest. This is about organizing God's uh, church the way that the Bible asks us to. Um, it's, it's not just to fill a position or, or maybe even someone you like. Uh, it's an obligation as the church to take this seriously uh, so that we can uh, get established the structure uh, that is needed here. So over these next few weeks, you're going to hear those Scripture passages, write them down, uh, and, and pray about them, and t- uh, talk to the Lord about them. If you have any questions, you can email me, you can call me, uh, you can talk to your deacon, whatever it may be. But uh, write July 16th on your calendar, uh, and then uh, listen and, and pray and fast about Uh, what we need to do next. We're at the crossroads. It's where we're at. So uh, just continue to think about that as we move forward. I want to speak with you this morning. We're navigating the Roman road, right? Uh, We talked last week about having a heartache for people who are lost. We we read uh, the first four verses in chapter of, of, uh, chapter 9 of Romans of where Paul had a heartache for his brethren, for this nation of Israel, uh, and he wanted them to, to come to Christ. So um, this morning, uh, as we talked last week about the song, the victory song kind of fade, and we started thinking about people that we know that uh, doesn't know Christ and, and our hearts Uh, ached about it this morning, I want to speak to you on this, listening to a podcast on straight talk about predestination. You know what? You say, oh my goodness, this is going to be boring, this is going to be whatever, controversial. I can tell you this, this week I have struggled with this chapter uh, just because there's so many views on this, there's so many different ways of looking at this. But it's like I told Laura this morning because Laura asked me, she said, what are you preaching on? I said, predestination. She said, oh, Chris, come on. (laughs) I said, Laura, you know what? When you go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, you can't skip things. And and in this, we have to look at this and we have to understand uh, what it's about and and, and, and the, the, the things that go with it. So... Over the past few months, I've been listening to podcasts. I don't know if you all do or not. Uh, these podcasts are usually anywhere between 30 to 80 minutes long. Uh, they're on an app that I have called Spotify. And I usually listen to them while I'm either cutting grass or, or I'm working out or doing something uh, to relax. I like listening to different things. It, it's something like talk radio with the exception of not being able to call into the show. So if you listen to a podcast, you can't interact. You're just listening to it. These podcasts have different topics concerning what's going on in the world. And over the past few weeks, I've been listening to Timothy Keller. I don't know if you knew who Timothy Keller was. He went home to be with the Lord. He was, uh, the, great, he was the pastor at Redeemer Church in New York, a uh, Presbyterian pastor. A great thinker, and his podcast was called Questioning Christianity, where he invited uh, the unsaved uh, to a safe place to where he would talk to them about the questions of the culture, and then they could have time to have a Q&A. And so he did this for six weeks in 2019. He was planning on doing it in 2020. Uh, He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and he went home to be with the Lord uh, several weeks ago. So he never made that. But that podcast relates to a lot of things that I look at, a lot of things that I study uh, in apologetics and evangelism. And apologetics, all it is is learning how to defend the faith, learning how to be able to have a conversation with someone about the things of the Bible or about the questions that they may have and then turning that conversation into what? Sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with them. So that's what he was doing on this particular podcast. There are several others that I talk, uh, listen to, one called Real Talk, one called Christ and the Culture. 
uh, they talk about all distinctive types of questions about the church. They talk about the different generations and their perspectives on life. Let me encourage you to do that. Let me encourage you to learn about other generations, folks, because we're, we're supposed to invest in the other generations. The older generation has some things that the new generation needs. The new generation has some of the older things uh, that, that the older generation need. We can learn from all being the body of Christ. That's the way Christ made it. And so let me in, encourage you uh, to not fill your mind with the things of the world, but to fill your things with the Lord and, and with what's going on in the culture and, and, and what we're facing um, this day and age. So it, it's an interesting concept in radio, I think. Uh, my brother and, and my son Jake introduced me to podcasts. Uh, Jake to different preachers and teachers, he'd say, Dad, listen to this, do this. You know, this is something we've been talking about, listen to this. But my brother Dan, in helping me define and outline and research what these podcasts are all about, how they go, uh, how they're outlined, and they are outlined. Uh, podcasts are outlined uh, in, a, in, in the same way as any other talk show or even a sermon. When you look at it, there's a subject, there are different views on the subject, there's evidence that backs up views on the subject, and then there's a conclusion on the subject. That's all a sermon is. That, 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 that's all anything is on talk show, radio, or TV. So um, it, it's kind of interesting this morning as I was reading this and, and as I was looking at it this week, you know, Paul's really talking on a podcast to Israel when you look at it. He, he's talking to them about the things that they really need to look at. And he's specifically talking to the nation of Israel. He, he's not talking to the Gentiles at this point. He's talking to the Roman, Roman believers as well as unbelievers in the church of Rome because there were people, you know, that weren't Christ followers. And so he was talking to him about what that heartache for his brethren he wished that they understood that they needed to accept Christ as the Messiah as their Savior and he's trying to build a bridge uh, between his brethren and Christ and while there were some racial tensions going on among the believers of, of the Roman congregation we'll see this we'll see that Rome says hey we're the chosen people or, I mean I'm sorry Israel says hey you know the Jews say hey we're the chosen people uh, we're the ones that, that are in God's graces. And then we'll see over here where Paul challenges the Gentiles not to be prideful, but they should be thankful that they're grafted in to the vine. And we'll see that in the coming weeks. But he's trying to connect or bring together both Gentile and Jewish groups. And what we're going to see is he's trying to explain to them the privileges and the honors the nation has in seeing uh, these. He, he's asking them to look at the evidence of Christ and that Christ came from the lineage of where? From Israel, right? So if you look in verses 4 and following, he's talking about who are the Israelites, to whom belongs the adoptions as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises, and who, whose are the fathers, and from whom is Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. So he's telling Israel, hey, here's your privileges. Here's your spiritual privileges right here. You, you should be proud of that. There's, there's nothing wrong with that because the Messiah, who has already what? Come in the flesh. Don't miss that point. You see, Israel or the nation of Israel is still trying to figure out if the Messiah has come. And what were they looking for? A political Messiah, right? That's what they were looking for. Just like a lot of people today is looking for a Savior, a political Savior, instead of the Savior of the world. So when you look at this, he's saying, hey, he's already come and he came in the flesh and his name is who? Jesus Christ. So he's trying to get them 
involved and he's trying to show them those privileges. So when we get it deeper into this chapter, we have this doctrine of predestination. And we'll see it in verse 11. Look in verse 11. For, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to what? His choice, right? His choice would stand not because of the works, but because of him who calls. So we're going to look at that, and we're going to look at how he selected Israel. We're going to discuss this verse in detail as well as a few others. I'm not going to read this whole chapter. I'll let you uh, do that on your own. But we're going to break down several verses in this chapter, and we're going to discuss them, and we're going to give a, a clear explanation of this doctrine of predestination. And, and it's pretty clear. But you know what? There's so many different views on this, we miss out on why this is so clear. There's misconcepts about this doctrine. So why, why Chris, would you do this? Well, it's interesting that this would pop up at this time. In the past month, I've, I've, I've had a conversation with a 70-something person who came up to me, even met with me several different times and asked how they could know if they had been chosen as one of God's elect or not. Now, now this was in this man's heart. I mean, he, he was just really frustrated with this. He was trying to figure this out. I asked him, how long? He said, it's been all my life, ever since I was 20 or 25, 30 years old. I'm trying to figure out if I'm a chosen or not. Been struggling for it for many years. How can I be assured if I'm saved? Because this passage in verse 13, look in verse 13. Just as it's written, Jacob, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. How do I know if God has loved me or hated me? You had people ask you that before? I've had, over my course of my years in ministry, even before that, I had people, how do I know if I'm God's elect? How do I know if I'm predestined to be going to heaven or hell? And they used this passage for that. You see, right here, it says Jacob and Esau. So we need to know how to answer that. He said, am I selected or not? So before we get into that, let me go back and review just a minute about what we talked about several weeks ago about the views on predestination, okay? These are really non-essentials. This has nothing to do with salvation or whether you have it or not. But these are the views that are out there that you may hear. Number one, there's an extreme view or a strong Calvinist view. And it says predetermination is in spite of God's foreknowledge. Now, you know what? You say, what's well, God's foreknowledge? It's one of his attributes. If you don't know the attributes of God, you need to study the attributes of God because if you don't study the attributes of God, then you don't know who God is or you lean to one more than another. So he, what, what this, this view looks, looks like is this. God operates with such unapproachability. He's so holy, his church choices are made without any consideration of man's choices. Okay? So God's the one that saves whoever he wishes to. Humans have no part in it. It's his work alone. No one else. It is given as irresistible grace. That's one of the sticking points about this view. It's irresistible grace. If you don't want anything to do with God, what this view says is that you can't help it. If God puts his hand on you, you have to accept his grace. He forces it on people is what, what this whole thing looks like. And it's a big player in this view because it denies man's free will or choice. That's the whole thing with this view. Uh, and in fact, there's a lot of folks that say there's no need for evangelism because the elect will be elected and the unelect won't be elected, right? 
<laughs> so we don't need any, any uh, need for evangelism. God only loves the elect, not the unsaved. Well, I think that's a contradiction of what Scripture talks about. There's too many verses that says God loves everyone, not just the elect. It minimizes man's personal responsibility for his actions. So I've told you before, I've met people all around in everything that I've done in the marketplace who says, hey, I'm chosen. I can go out and live my life like the world, and it doesn't matter because God has elected me. It's a dangerous, dangerous way of viewing salvation. Then there's a view called Armenianism, named after the man who founded it. And he says that God predetermined, or his predetermination is based on his foreknowledge, on God's foreknowledge. It's all based on his foreknowledge. God knows in advance what choices every human makes, including salvation. He elects to those he knows in advance uh, will by their free choices accept Christ. There's no co coercion. There's, there, there's no force in this. Humans are completely free to accept or reject God's invitation. The problem with this view is God is absolutely, or yeah, problem is God is absolutely in control based on human reason and not grace. He's not completely sovereign because it depends on man's faithfulness and not God's. Okay? And then there's a third view that's called moderate Calvinism. Moderate Calvinism. God predetermined, uh, or his predetermination, is based in according with his foreknowledge. In according with his foreknowledge. So what does that mean? Well, it means that God's election is not based on his foreknowledge of man's free choice. That's Armenianism. Nor in spite of God's foreknowledge, that's extreme Calvinism, but in according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, where, where does this view get it? Out of 1 Peter 1 and 2. He, Peter says this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are aliens scattered throughout Pontus, uh, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Benitha, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be with you. Whatever God knows in this view, whatever God knows, he determines. Whatever he determines, he knows. From all eternity, including free choices of human beings, God is completely sovereign in ultimately determining what occurs, yet humans are completely free and responsible for what they do. Now you say, Chris, this is a lot of stuff. If you want this sermon, email me and I'll, mail, I'll, I'll, I'll email this whole thing to you so that you can have it in notes. Just email me. But here's the whole thing. Your view of salvation falls within one of those three views. How you look at things, how you answer questions falls within those three views of how people are saved. And then how all that happens and how you sit down and you answer these questions for people. So I've given you books. I've given you uh, Chosen But Free by Norman Geisler, uh, Chosen uh, by R.C. Sproul. Um, are the two books that I, I read a lot of time on, on these things. They all give you arguments for all three of these views and, and who they think is that you have to work it out, okay? I know what I believe. I know why I believe it. I know that I can back it up in Scripture. But you guys have to do that. Don't, don't take my word for it. You have, to, you have to work it out. You have to see how all of this comes about. Now, we've looked at those three, three views. Need to know that they're non-essentials of the faith, meaning that salvation does not come from whether you hold these beliefs or not. However, it's important 
and needs to be pondered due to the evangelism and the sanctification process that you go through that we've been talking about. It's a little bit deep, isn't it? See, I knew this morning that this was either going to do one of two things. You're either going to check out or you're going to say, hey, you know what? There's more to this than what I've even thought about. We have to learn about these things. We just don't cruise through life with a bunch of alphabet cereal and just throw it up and say, here's your answer, right? And we have to know what we know. You know what you know in everyday choices of your life, right? How you spend your money, where it's going, how you do this, how you do that. Same way with the Bible and with what you believe and why you believe it. So let's look at this. Let's look in these passages at the question of predestination, which are often used to support arguments about God's love and, and what is called a limited atonement, that God only saves some or that Christ didn't die for all. He only died for the elect. So let's look at this. Look in verse 11. We already read it, right? So that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Now, you know what? I have no qualm about God making a choice. It's his prerogative. He's God, I'm not, right? I have no problem with that. He could have chosen any nation why did he choose Israel? Because that's the nation he wanted, right? But he could have chose any nation for the Messiah to come, but he said, no, I'm going to choose this nation. I don't have a problem with that. He chose Israel for the fact of Jesus' lineage. What I do have a problem is when Christians take this passage out of Scripture when they talk about individual salvation. That's where I start having a problem with it, okay? Now, what do, you, what do you mean? This passage has nothing to do with individual salvation and whose God elect may be. This passage has to do with a nation. You get that? God chose a nation. He chose Israel. That's in the context of the Scripture. He didn't choose an individual person for salvation. He, he chose a nation for that. Different views take this passage and make a conclusion out of it that says this. God only loves some but not all when it comes to salvation. If, if God is a God of love, then how can we hate a person? Now, these are the questions that I've been asked, okay? How can he hate Esau and love Jacob? That's what it says, right, in verse 13. Just as it's written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I hated. You see, he hated Esau, and he loved Jacob. That's how God can hate the unelect and, and, and love the elect. How can he have mercy on some but not others. Verse 15, look in verse 15. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. How can he harden some unbelief but not others? Verse 18. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. Okay? So, so how can he destine some to destruction and not others? Verse 22, what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath to make his power known, endured with much patience uh, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? All good questions, right? You ever read that chapter and asked those questions? You ever looked at them? Have you ever had people ask you that? God hates people. He has mercy on who he wants to have. He hardens people's hearts. What type of God is he? How can he be a God of love? All good questions. Been asked multiple times about these. I've discussed these questions with both believers and unbelievers. And if we're not careful as believers, we can jeopardize our evangelism concerning these questions and who God claims to be. 
See, it's, there, there's eternal value in this. This is why we need to understand what this is all about. So let's look at these objections carefully and put these passages in context. The first truth we need to see is this. As I've already said, Paul is not talking about an individual election, but a national or corporate election. We've already read that. How do we know that? Well, Jacob is the nation of Israel, right? That's what you need to say, yeah. You need to shake your head, yes. Esau is the nation of Edom. How do I know that? Write down Malachi 1-2 beside your notes. Edomites were evil and did evil deeds against Israel. It's well documented in the Bible. I'm going to let you look it up. Search the scriptures like the Bereans did. Yet scripture does not teach that Edomites cannot be saved. Now look at this. In Amos 9.12, Ruth 1, Revelation 7.9 teaches that there were Edomites and Moabites who were saved. All enemies of Christ and of Israel, right? So you see, this passage is talking about nations. And a critical point that a lot of folks miss is this. Not every individual in Israel is going to be saved. Did you know that? Look in Romans 9, 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. So you know what? Not all of Israel is going to be saved. There's going to be people who are in Israel who are Israelites who will never put their trust in Jesus Christ. You see, the channel through the blessing of the Messiah was supposed to come, uh, was coming for salvation for all. So the Messiah was was, uh, coming out of the nation, and and it was for salvation of everyone, Genesis 12.1. Through 3, Romans 9, 4, and 5. So the word hate then is taken into today's terms uh, instead of what it meant back then. So you know what? We've got it. This, ta- this, is pa- this, this passage is talking about the nation of Israel, Jacob, not individual, Esau, Moabites, Edomites, enemies, but we see that people do come from those nations, right, who are going to be saved. And then we see this. We see that word hate in there. Esau, I hated. It, 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 it's taken into today's terms. You know what? If you hate someone today, what happens? You're divided, you, you're angry, you, 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 you see it all over television and the media and everything else, right? It's not what it meant. What it means in the, in the Greek and the, in the Hebrew is this, it means love less. Love less with less affection. It does not mean not to love at all. It means to love less. Now, how can we put that into our minds? Well, Genesis 29 30 and 31 said, what, that Rachel was loved more and Leah was loved less. Well, it doesn't mean that Leah was hated because she had 10 children as well as um, Rachel having children. And then in Matthew 10, 37, Jesus says this, love me more than father or mother. Right? Jesus says, if you don't hate your father and mother, brother and sister, to come and follow me. It doesn't mean, it just means to love less. 
You know what? I'm supposed to be the first love. You love me. You love your spouse and your family, but you love them less than me, right? That's what it means. And that's what it means here in this scripture. But, but what about Pharaoh? Who hardened Pharaoh's heart? Look in 17. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up to discriminate. Uh, d- distri- <laughs> I get it out. Demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed through the whole earth. And then you go back up to 15. He says, I'll have mercy on her. I have compassion on I want to. And in 18, he says, he has mercy on whom he desires and hardens whom he desires. So, you know what? This God you're talking about can harden hearts. What about Pharaoh? How come he hardened Pharaoh's heart? Well, first of all, what we have to understand in Exodus 5, 1 and 2, Exodus 7, 3 um, through 14, and Exodus 8, 15, 19, and 32 is this. Is Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Now, how did he do that? Well, first of all, when, when Moses said, let my people go, you know what the Lord God said, and he said, hey, I'm just paraphrasing this. You can go back to those scriptures. Hey, you know what? I don't know your God because I'm God. So, so that was the first rejection, right? And then there were ten more. The plagues. With each plague... God was trying to show Pharaoh who he was, the God that he was. But Pharaoh kept saying, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not going to let you go. Uh Uh-uh, I'm not going to let you go. Uh Uh-uh, I'm not going to let you go. And each time he was denying God and his heart was being hardened. And God finally said, okay. See, that's a little bit different than what we read in this passage. That's a little bit different than what people want to discuss and sit down and talk about with these things. They think that, that, that God is this awful God who's angry in the New Testament, who's a God of love in the Old Testament, but they don't know his attributes and they don't know what and how he brought this plan of redemption in. God did harden Pharaoh's heart in Exodus nine twelve. He tried to get him to repent with those ten plagues, but he refused. Now, I'm going to give you a, an example. I don't know who, who, who did this example. I, I forgot to write it down, but this is not me in this illustration. I did not come up with this. It says, the same sun that can melt wax is the same sun that hardens clay. The problem does not lie lay with the source, God, but with the recipient, humans. Think about that. Think about that just a minute. What does he mean, the vessels of wrath in in verse 22 we, we read? What does that mean? That they're responsible for their own decision. They rejected God even though he has patience. And that's what 2 Peter 3, 9 says. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for what? All to come to repentance. That's everyone. That's everyone that's ever lived. That's everyone from time of Adam and Eve until the end of the world. He wishes all to come to repentance with him. Scripture teaches us that God loves all people. John 3, 16, 1 John 2, 2, 1 Timothy 2, 4, and that he is patient with all people. That's what, that's what uh, Romans 9, 22 says. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath, he was wanting to go ahead and demonstrate his wrath, to make his power known, hey, I'm God, you're not, I'm just going to put the wrath on you, endure with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Let me tell you this, folks. If you're a Christian, you used to be a prepared vessel for wrath. Don't be so prideful in saying, just like the Jews, hey, you know what, I'm a chosen one, I'm an elect one. You know, I don't have to do this or I don't have to do that. And I'm, don't be so prideful. We'll get to that in chapter 10. So 
so God does not hate the non-elect or that he loves them any less. He loves those who accept salvation so amazingly, so splendidly, so magnificently. His love is his love, which is rejected by the non-believers, that it looks like hate in comparison. Isn't that a sweet, that's not mine either. Same guy that said one up above said this one, and I just forgot to give him credit, so please forgive me. Isn't that, isn't that sweet? You, know, you, know, you wonder why people are jealous of, of you that as you go in uh, to your families and as you serve Lord and, and as you, if people see things in, in your life. It's because what they see. They see God's love through you who they're trying to deny and they say, and, and, and they hate it and they're rejecting it. It's so amazing. Why? Because he does bless us. Even though we go through this trials and temptations over our years and curves and valleys on this road and uh, potholes in the middle of it, he loves us. His love operates persuasively, not against human will. I want you to think about that. You can't make your first grade girlfriend or boyfriend love you, can you? I love you. You love me. You you can't force that lady that you would like to spend your life with who says, no, you're not the right person. You can't force her to marry you, right? God is not going to force you to be a son or daughter, and to live with him eternally if it's against your will. Otherwise, if he did it against your will, he wouldn't be a God that you want to worship, right? His love operates... Not against human will. Forced love is not love at all. Hey, there's no shotgun weddings in heaven nor on earth. Not from God's point. See, it's all wrapped up into who God is and 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 and, and seeing what his attributes are and, and, and how it consistently goes across Genesis through Revelation. And, and, and the contradictions aren't there. I've said this before. I'll say it again. Contradictions come when we don't understand it. Or when we think we have a right answer. That's why I say, study it. All views. I'm not going to force one view on you or another one. You guys study it. Come up with it. We must realize the way we view this doctrine of predestination. Why? Because it has that eternal importance tied to it. It's it's the way we answer people's questions. In a way we carry out as Christians, not in arrogance, but in humility of what the Lord's done for us and what he can do for others. So when people say, I'm not of the elect, how do I know if I'm the elect or not? My question is, how do you not? You don't know. Nobody knows. But God, that's why evangelism, and he gave us the the great commission, Matthew 28. Go, therefore. He didn't say, don't worry about it. He said, go. Understanding the importance of evangelization and having the right answers for these public Puzzling question. It, it, it is something we all need. It is. Because even if you don't have friends that say this, grandchildren, neighbors, children, whoever they are, they're going to ask these questions. And if you say, I don't know, go ask whoever. What they're going to do is they're going to go ask whoever 
and they're going to get the wrong answer. Reading book on Generation Z, this last generation, there's more atheists in Generation Z than there has been in any other generation. Is the doctrine of predestination an obstacle for you this morning? Is it? Maybe you're here this morning and say, well, I don't know, just like this guy. I don't know if I'm elect. I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what I showed him. Okay? Verse 33. And I'll close here shortly. Chapter 9, verse 33. Just as it's re- written, Behold, I lay in, in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This is what I ask him. Is this question of predestination, of being an elect or whatever it is, is it a stumbling block? Because the only stumbling block that there is is if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's what the Scriptures say. The Jews stumbled over it. Peter even writes about it in his letters. You know what? Stumbling block. Who is he? Jesus Christ. He's the Savior. And that's what Paul's trying to get across to the the nation of Israel. Don't let this be a stumbling block. Don't let your pridefulness be a stumbling block. Don't, don't, Don't let all these questions be a stumbling block. Come to Jesus Christ and you will not be disappointed And he will answer the questions. Don't let it be. Jesus came to give you hope in a hopeless world. There is nothing beyond his power to transform your life, to show you how to overcome your hopelessness uh, in him. He came to give you new life, new way of thinking, new way to view the world around you. But first of all, You must realize you need to have a Savior, folks. From what? Your sins. Those trespasses that are making you miserable. The standards you have missed from God. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And our wages is what? Death. That's what Paul says. That's why we're winding down this Roman road. But because God loves us, he demonstrated his love for you and for me that he sent his son to die on the cross for your sin. He died and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again to overcome sin and death. Now he has given you a free gift, and that gift is eternal life. How do we get it? How do we get it? Romans 10, 9 and 10. We'll get to this next week, but I'm going to give it to you right now. If we confess with your mouth, or if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is the Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For what? With the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Let me just give you an inside tip. He was talking to the nation of Israel in that passage. But he's talking to us today too, church. Don't let that be a stumbling block. Don't let all these questions, all these excuses be a stumbling block to come to Jesus Christ. And then learn. Dive in. You know what? This man who said, I'm I'm here I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried in three days, I'm going to raise on the third day. Guess what he did? He did it. I believe it. And I'm going to follow a man who said that very exact same thing because nobody can find his body because it's with him at the right hand of the Father in heaven. So let me ask you this. Will you reach out this morning and accept that gift if you haven't? 
All you got to do is just tell him you're sorry for your sins that you committed, that you're deeply sorry. Repent of those sins. Say, say you know what, I'm going to turn, Lord, and I'm going to walk your way. Trust in him and him alone. There's nothing else that you can do. Trust in him and him alone and the work that he did. No other work can get to it. Believing that he died and was buried and rose again. Church, it's very real. These questions are very real, and they're out there. Friends, family, acquaintances, I want to challenge you to know what you believe and why you believe it, not just to give some soft answer that that you've heard someone else give, but that you learn and you know how and you know how to put Scripture in context and you sit down and you talk to them because of the love that you have for them, because of the love Christ has for you. So as Meg comes and Joseph comes, we're going to have this time of invitation. And we're going to sing about his beautiful name again because it is beautiful. So you do what the Lord through the Holy Spirit is asking you to do. The angel said his name will be Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Let's stand and sing Jesus' name above all names. We thank you that we could come into your house today and just worship you. What a great, great day it's been to be able to lift up the name of Jesus. To be uh, and put our focus on him. Lord, to be challenged in thinking, being able to chew upon things through the rest of the week. To be able to put things in perspective. Father, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy and your grace. We thank you so much, Lord, for your word, which is true. We thank you, Lord, that we can understand it because we have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, who guides us through it. So, Father, as we leave this place today, I pray, Lord, that you'll open doors for us this week. Open up doors and opportunities to talk to people about you. Maybe this conversation right here. And Lord, as we answer their questions, as we talk to them, give us that opportunity to turn them towards Jesus. Lord, we just thank you so much for the way that you work in our hearts and in our lives. Just pray, Lord, that you would just be with each and every one. Ask, Lord, that you'll put a shield of protection around them. Smile upon them. Bless them, Lord. For it's in your son's name we make this prayer. Amen. Thank you all.